Hello everyone, this is Alan Prost and I'm bringing you Module 4, Modes of Ventilation Part 2. This is a series of short videos presenting to you the PowerPoint slides for review in the course of RESP 220. With these slides I hope you can stop and pause and review the sections that you think are important. So we're going to go through them together. I recommend that you uh, copy the uh, worksheets from D2L and follow along with those worksheets and complete those worksheets after reviewing all of these PowerPoint uh, videos. Okay, so for some time now in uh, RESP 220, we've been talking about these different modes of ventilation. And I know that we've talked about volume control, we've talked about pressure control, we've talked about the different breath types, about continuous mandatory ventilation, we've talked about IMV, intermittent mandatory ventilation, and continuous spontaneous ventilation. We reviewed all of these and we're going to do that in detail in the next few minutes with these series of videos. All right. Now the main modes of ventilation are volume control and pressure control. And we've also got this other one we've included, pressure regulated volume control. All right. Those are our main modes that we've been looking at, utilizing the breath types of continuous mandatory ventilation and IMV. All right. We've also been talking about, but we haven't looked in detail yet, at pressure support and volume support. And these are our modes that we're looking at to talk about continuous spontaneous ventilation. With these modes, we can augment the spontaneous efforts of breathing patients. Some of the other modes we're going to look at in this module include airway pressure release ventilation, mandatory minute ventilation, proportional assist ventilation, and high frequency ventilation. These modes are very interesting, but they're not used quite as often as some of the other modes, but we will review them in detail in this series of videos. This is not a complete list of videos, but what this is, is a good introduction to the basic video, um, modes of ventilation. All right. So volume control, well, we've all been talking about that for some time now, so I think you should be very familiar with it. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about continuous mandatory ventilation and IMV. I'm going to leave continuous support ventilation for another video. All right. So the key thing about volume control ventilation is we set a critical tidal volume. And that's important because that combined with the respiratory rate allows us to control minute ventilation. All right. We know that the volume and flow relationship are linked together. And that volume flow relationship determines how quickly the breath will be delivered and how large the breath will be. The pressures within the lungs are controlled by the patient's lung compliance. The resistance is also a factor, and we'll talk about that in detail. This can be used with the breath types of CMV or IMV. Some of us, and this is a very good mode to use with patients that we don't know much about. So when we first get a patient in, say, emergency, we don't know anything about their lung characteristics, we can throw them on this mode and be assured that we've got an, an, um, a set minute ventilation. So that's one of the really important aspects about this mode. By setting the respiratory rate and the tidal volume, we're assuring that our patient's getting a nice, precise minute ventilation to control their blood gases. We also hope that it'll have a um, decrease our patient's work of breathing, particularly in the mode of CMV. All right. Now, the proviso is that the sensitivity and flow will be set appropriately. The sensitivity will always be set correctly, and you'll be taught how to do that. The flow can be set from anywhere initially from 40 to, say, 60 liters per minute. These what we think are the normal inspiratory flows of our patient. But it's important to realize that we must meet or exceed that inspiratory flow of our patient. If our patient is very air hungry, we may have to increase this inspiratory flow to make sure that we're decreasing the work of breathing. All right. Some of the disadvantages of this is that pressure is altered throughout the mode. And that means any changes in the patient's lung compliance or the resistance, which is seldom because this is the resistance is due to the endotracheal tube, but lung compliance can increase or decrease and that would alter the pressures in the lungs and that's a concern to us because we're trying to always limit lung damage. The flow is fixed but that may not be a major problem except if we're not meeting the patient's inspiratory demands. Now the key thing about volume control ventilation is that we are concerned about regional alveolar over distension and this is the concept where as I'm going to try to show you in this slide where if we have variations in lung compliance, we could have differences in ventilator or alveolar distension. In this first model here, we have 
uniform lung compliance throughout, so the volume is going to be delivered uniformly in all regions of the lungs. But as in this model here is trying to show us, if we have decreased compliance on this zone and normal compliance on this, in this alveolar over here, alveoli over here, you can see that this is going to mean that we have decreased volumes in this side and increased volumes on this side of the lung. So here we are, we've got the healthy alveoli, and it's being over distended because of this decreased compliance in this zone over here. And this is what we are talking about when we talk about regional over distension. And this is a possibility in the mode of volume control. So with volume control, as you've been playing with on your virtual ventilators assignment, you know that we set the rate, we set a specific tidal volume, we set the inspiratory flow. We may set a TI pause, and we're going to look at that in detail. All right. We always set a PEEP, and it's good to usually set a PEEP of maybe plus 5 to start because we think that's a normal physiological feed, uh, PEEP, and we may increase or decrease this depending on the patient's lung characteristics. We set an FiO2, and... If we don't know anything about our patients and we're very concerned about their oxygen um, saturations, we may initially set this at 1. Often, if we think the patient is reasonably uh, stable, we might set it at something like 0.6 and then vary it depending on their needs from their pulse oximeter. We'll always set the sensitivity correctly. All right. So these time relationships that we're talking about, how do we control that? things like that I ratio? Well, the first key component of that is the rate and we'll set the total cycle time. In module five, we'll look at these in detail, but just to give you a quick uh, review, we have 60 seconds in a minute, and if we had a rate of 12 established on our, on our ventilator, that would give us five seconds for our T, our total cycle time. The relationship between tidal volume and flow, that determines our TI dynamic. That's how long the breath takes to go in. Obviously, if we increase the flow, the TI dynamic would decrease. If we decrease the flow, the TI dynamic would go slower. Our TI pause is going to directly increase the TI total. All right? So let's just pretend in this case we've got 1.0 seconds for each of these. That'll give us a TI total of 2 seconds. All right? And then what that means is that we would have 3 seconds left over for TE. So that gives us a 2 to 3 or a 1 to 1.5 IE ratio. And we always report that to the lowest common uh, numerator. So we'd call that a 1 to 1.5 IE ratio. The PEEP does not alter the time relationships. All right. As a short note here, some ventilators do always have a TI pause established, even in volume control ventilation. That's a relatively uh, new aspect of a lot of mechanical ventilators that they always have a, the time cycling element to this okay when we look at our virtual ventilators as you've been playing with so they might give us a, re uh, a rough reference I'm going to show here we've got a tidal volume set of 700 we've got a flow rate set of 60 in this instance we have no inspiratory pause and a rate of 12 so my total cycle time is five seconds all right the relationship of flow rate and uh, tidal volume gives us a TI dynamic of 0.7 seconds. So it takes 0.7 seconds to put the breath in. All right. Now we have no pause set, so the TI total is the same. This gives us an I ratio of 1 to 6.1. All right. And this is taking... So this just brings us back to that idea of there's lots of exhalation time, lots of times for, for, uh, for the breath to come back to zero flow. When we add an inspiratory pause, as I'm showing here, and you can really see it here on the flow waveform, because the inspiratory pause is a zone of no flow because I have equilibrium between mouth pressures and lung pressures. It's a very important concept. Um, what I've done here, I've just added that little bit of half a second here of inspiratory pause. So my TI dynamic has stayed the same because I haven't changed the, the tidal volume or the flow rate. But my TI total has been increased by 0 0.5 seconds all right so i still got that idea of the ti dynamic being 0 0.7 seconds but my now my total ti is 1.2 seconds all right that leaves over 3.8 seconds for expiratory time and that gives me an IE ratio of 1 to 3.2 okay you can see my 
inspiratory pause being held here. All right. When we talk about the phase variables, and you know we've been talking about those a lot in class, the trigger is by time for a mandatory breath, and it's assisted when the patient triggers the ventilator, often with flow or pressure triggers. It's limited by flow, and when it hits the certain whatever our tidal volume we had determined, it's volume cycled into exhalation. When we put on the inspiratory pause, these don't change, but we've added now a volume element that's being held during inspiration. So we have to include as a limit both the flow and the volume. The cycling now is going to be controlled by that TI pause. Once that time has elapsed, we're going to cycle into exhalation. Now, some people would include the volume as being part of that because if I have a low flow rate or a high flow rate, this could take a long time. All right, But I think it's probably clearest just to state this as being time cycled. But I wouldn't mark you wrong if you also said that there's a volume element into the cycling. Okay. Here's another representation of our breath that we've been talking about so much in class. And I think you should be getting fairly comfortable with this now. Initially, what happens is the ventilator is triggered. All right. So we've got a trigger, and that's the first thing that happens. And I always like to talk about these in order. Then the flow triggers on, and it's held for a duration of time until the last thing that occurs during the breath is that it cycles due to volume. All right. So this is our cycling here, cycling into volume. When we add that inspiratory pause on here, all we're doing is adding a little bit of time so that there's equilibrium between mouth and lung pressures. And that's indicated where we have our no flow, and this is a, shows us where we have our inspiratory pause, that zone of no flow. All right. So this adds now. So in our limit now, we have flow and time limits. So both occur. Now here's where it gets tricky because this section of time in here could be altered by the volume elements, but it's not until after that little bit of time has occurred, not until after the TI pause has gone through that we cycle into exhalation. So it might be best to state that it's time cycled. Okay. Now these pressure relationships are very important for us in the mode of volume control because our PIP is what we see on the ventilator very often. But we have to make sure that we realize it's made up of multiple components. It's made up by the pressure due to the resistance and the pressure due to compliance, changes in patient's compliance, and the amount of PEEP that we have established on the ventilator. So that's what this equation is showing us. All right. So what this means is we have to take into account and understand the pressure relationship of resistance. Resistance often controlled by our endotracheal tube. When we increase or decrease flow, we're going to get more pressure built up in our circuit, and that's going to contribute to our PIP. All right. So the pressure generated in this in the uh, in the circuit and um, at the mouth is due to the resistance and the flow. So anything that increases or decreases the flow is going to increase or decrease our pressure due to resistance. Now the resistance doesn't usually change that much because it's controlled by the endotracheal tube. All right. Now this is an important one: the compliance. So changes in volume result in changes in pressure. So when we look at that pressure component in our lungs, we can see that increases or decreases in volume are critical. Increases or decreases in compliance are also critical. So we control this one. And this is the result of lung characteristics. So if the patient has decreased compliance and so we put in the same volume, that's going to increase our pressures. We have to understand that relationship intimately. All right? That's part of that virtual ventilators assignment. And I was hoping you'd learn that. So this is when we combine all of these elements together, we come up with this equation of motion, and that shows all the factors that are involved in our peak inspiratory pressure. But I think it's the pressure due to compliance that's our most important element that we're going to look at. Okay, and that P plat, which is a critical element because that's going to be determining how much damage we're doing to our lungs, how much pressure we're delivering to the lungs is due to volume and compliance. Also, the PEEP clearly is part of this. So anytime we increase the PEEP, we're going to be increasing our P plat. All right. So what factors affect plateau pressure? This is a, a key question 
often asked of respiratory therapists and particularly of students. All right. So what factors affect plat pressures? All right. What factors affect plat pressures? The first being the patient's lung compliance. Right. The next would be the volume that we're putting in the circuit. All right. And the amount of PEEP. So I'd expect you to realize that any time we've altered these, so if a patient has decreased compliance or increased volume or we increase the PEEP, the result of that is going to be an increase in P plat. Okay, so let's make sure we remember those. So that's the end of our discussion on volume ventilation. I'm going to be sending out and you'll have, uh, you should have available to you the other short videos on the other modes of ventilation. Thank you very much.